ahead of the game being released and prices being announced. Here are the players I've got my eye on. So starting things off, I've gone for Pascal Gross. He finished as the top scoring Brighton midfielder in FPL last season, despite Mitoma, March, McAllister all having fantastic seasons. Gross outscored all of them. And well, certainly when McAllister wasn't in the form or the, you know, the presence in the team that he was last season, Pascal Gross was the penalty taker for Brighton. So now McAllister's gone to Liverpool. You've got to think Pascal Gross might be taking them penalties again. And that that makes him an even better option than he was last season, in my opinion. He's absolutely nailed to play in that Brighton lineup. The only time we didn't see him playing was during the mass rotation that Brighton had towards the end of the season. Just with all the volume of games, I think, you know, it's fair to say even the, you know, some of the most nailed players were going to get rotated. And, and that's what happened with Pascal Gross. I do believe he's one of the most nailed players in that Brighton starting lineup. And certainly at the beginning of the season when there's, you know, not a great deal of games. It's just Premier League and a couple of cup games thrown in. You've got to think he's going to be nailed to start every game. And... I just have a feeling he's going to be a reasonable price. There's no way, in my opinion, that FPL are going to price him like 8 million or something like that. I think he's going to be between 6 and 7 million, and that for me makes him a great option. You look at the stats he had last season, 9 goals, 8 assists in 37 games. He had a really good season, and the expected stats are a bit under that, I'll admit, but they're going to be boosted by penalties next season. And he actually expected to get 11 assists when he achieved 8, so he underperformed on the assists he could have gotten. You can see there, I've pulled up, the Draft Hound expected points. You'll find a link to Draft Hound in the description. All of the players' expected points for the first five game weeks of the season have been updated in the game now. They're going through a few iterations to add features, but expected points is in there now, and you can see them there. Next up, we've got Brian Mbumo. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. You can correct me in the comments if that's not the case. From Brentford, I think he's a fantastic option in FPL for next season, provided he comes in at a good price. And to be honest, depending on if he's classified as a midfielder or a striker, obviously he was a striker in the game last season. I've just got a sneaking feeling they might make him a midfielder, but we'll wait and see on his price and position. But regardless, I think he's going to turn into Brentford's talisman next season. You know, the Tony situation that they have, it means they probably can't sell him because no one's going to want to play, buy a player that's banned until like January. And they also, you know, they're not going to replace him because he's back in January. So this team is going to stay the same. And it's almost just going to be like Tony's injured for a few months where they're not necessarily going to buy like a first class replacement. They're going to have to rely on the rest of the squad to fill the void. And Brian and Bumo is going to have to do that for Brentford. He's the penalty taker when Tony's off the pitch, similar to the story I told about Pascal Gross um, with McAllister. I think he's going to become the Brentford talisman. And season on season, he's gotten better in the Premier League. The first season he had in the Premier League, he was just missing chances left, right and centre. Last season, he did much better. Nine goals, eight assists in 38 games. is a fantastic set of returns. And the expected numbers are there or thereabouts. He didn't overperform or underperform. You know, he had the season that he was expected to. With penalties added on, I mean, you're looking at maybe a 15 sort of goal season and maybe more assists, um, you know, given the fact that he's going to be the talisman and given the ball more. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. But I think all the, you know, the stars are aligning, in my opinion, for Brian and Bumo to have a great start to the season while we wait for Tony to return. Okay, my next player, this isn't really a surprise, but Brighton have such a fantastic start to the season in terms of fixtures. Luton, Wolves and West Ham, they're three good fixtures and I feel like the Brighton defence, they're worth having a piece of. And Purvis Estupinian is the strongest Brighton defender in my opinion. He proved it last season, he played pretty much every game, 35 games played in the Premier League, only missed three and again that was due to some rotation I think he actually picked up a couple of injuries as well, a couple of little niggles, which meant he couldn't play. Got one goal, five assists, better than any other Brighton defender. His underlying numbers, pretty similar to those returns, so he didn't overperform or underperform, and they were the best across the Brighton defenders. And yeah, just generally, I think they've got a great start. And when you look at the expected points for the Brighton team, Estu Pinyan has the best expected points for the first three game weeks. He's better than any of the midfielders, any of the strikers. That's obviously due to the fact he's got some attacking upside, and they're heavily back to keep some clean sheets as well. So yeah, comparatively, you know, a lot of people, I've already mentioned Pascal Gross, a lot of people considering Matoma, March, you know, Nathan uh, Evan Ferguson, I'm pretty sure his name is. Forgive me for getting that wrong. A lot of people considering those players from Brighton. But Estu Pinyan, certainly on the draft hand expected points numbers, is leading the way. And that's why I think he's going to be a lock. Providing he doesn't come in at a ridiculous price, I think he's going to be under 6 million. Providing he comes in at that sort of price, it's going to be a lock in my team. 
Now, next up, this won't come as a surprise to you, but Trent Alexander-Arnold, providing he's classed as a defender and comes in in and around the price he was last season, he's going to be an absolute lock in my team. And I think he's going to be one of the most popular players in the game in general. He's obviously absolutely nailed to start for Liverpool. There isn't really any competition for that right-back spot. And to be honest, he's not even playing right-back. That inverted midfield role Klopp had him playing last season towards the end, he was playing absolutely out of his skin. And the, the, the attacking returns absolutely rocketed up from what was a relatively disappointing sort of first half, first three quarters of the season. And yeah, I just think that role is absolutely suited to the talents that Trent Alexander-Arnold has. And I'm really, well, pleased at least for England that he's being used in that way. I also feel like the, the signings that Liverpool have already made, you know, the likes of McAllister in midfield and the players that they're linked with, that's going to improve their defence. I feel like the problem that Liverpool had last season wasn't necessarily the defenders, it was the midfielders' ability to cover them. You know, Klopp's system relies on just intense pressing and pressure. I don't think they were getting that from their midfielders last year. They know the likes of Wijnaldum that were in their teams a previous season. And Henderson, when he was a bit younger, I just feel like he's lost his legs a little bit now. That's how a Klopp team operates, and that brings the best out of both the defence and the attack. And when they don't have that, like we saw last season, they drop off a little bit. So, you know, if Liverpool make good signings in midfield, I feel like they're going to build themselves back up defensively. And Trent Alexander-Arnold, well, he's already a lock in my team, but that will make him an even better option. And you look at those draft hand expected points, sorry, I was pointing the wrong way, the draft hand expected points over there, they're looking fantastic for those first three games. And you've got to say, even though the first three fixtures, they're not the easiest. Chelsea, difficult. Well, I think they'll be difficult under Poch with some new signings and a preseason behind them. Bournemouth's a good game. And then Newcastle as well. I know they're, you know, two strong teams. I still back Liverpool to win those games, or at least Trent to score some points. And finally, it's the three Arsenal midfielders. Now, depending on how they're priced up depends on who I pick. But for me, Odegaard, Martinelli and Saka, I'm going to have two of them in my team to start the season off. As long as they come in sort of in and around or under 9 million, I feel like any of them are good options and you're going to get what you pay for. Looking at their stats last season, there really isn't much to choose between them. Saka arguably had the better season, you know, getting a lot more assists than the likes of Odegaard and Martinelli did. Obviously, Odegaard and Martinelli both scored 15 goals. When you look at the underlying numbers, as you can see, Saka slightly outperformed his expected assists and expected goals. And the other two slightly, well, also Odegaard looking like he overperformed them as well slightly. And you can see the stats there. I don't need to go through them in detail. But for me, provided they come in at a sensible price, I think they're going to be more, more than worth the budget that you're going to spend on them. The only thing I would say, probably Martinelli is the one... Well, the fact they signed Kai Havertz, right? He's got to have some sort of impact on that squad. Whether he starts game week one in the Premier League remains to be seen, but he adds a healthy level of competition in that Arsenal midfield. The only player I don't see getting replaced by Havertz is Bukayo Saka. I feel like the left footer on the right-hand side is really beneficial for Arsenal, but I don't feel like Havertz really plays that position at all. I feel like Havertz can play wide left, behind the striker or even up front if they need him, and that means Martinelli and Odegaard's place are more at risk, whereas Saka, you've got to think he's going to be now to start every game, regardless of how Havertz is getting on. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the Arsenal mids. I'm definitely going to be having two of them to start the season. And that was the end of the video. I hope you can tell that I'm getting excited for the game to launch now. I'm having some thoughts now about players that I want to pick, as you can see. I think regardless of price, these are the players that are on my watch list, and I'll be eagerly awaiting to see what position they get classed at and how much they're going to cost me. If you enjoyed the video, Please leave me a like rating and subscribe to the Golden Gold channel, which should be, I'm pointing in the wrong direction, about there on the screen. And yeah, I'll catch you in the next video.